Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Storm, and this is Ben, and we're proud to represent our team in uh, showing our design for a biocomposite-based fruit coating that we think uh, is an innovative solution to minimizing global food waste. So what was our motivation behind choosing this as our design topic? Well, it was actually twofold. Firstly, I'll speak a little bit about the financial uh, aspect of things. Uh, and a number I really want to hit you hard is the Canadian consumers and businesses throw out $31 billion worth of food annually. And a majority of that is the fresh produce that you find in grocery stores, not the processed or canned foods. Uh, and people, I think, have started to notice that this is a big number. And this has led to the development of new solutions for maintaining this and decreasing the amount of loss uh, that we have, or sorry, decreasing the amount of waste that we have. Um, on that note, the fruit coating market alone is valued at about $2.1 billion uh, US in 2017 and is, only, or, and is expected to grow at an annual growth rate of about 4.5%. Um, so we can clearly see that there is some monetary value if we improve even just one aspect of this industry. However, we think that uh, by creating a coating that improves shelf life, uh, we're not only um, going to have financial gain, but we're going to provide or create new potential markets and extend existing distribution pathways across uh, the continent. So potentially more, um, argu or arguably a more important motivation is our obligation to the global community. And that's a significant part of the global population is undernourished. It's 12.9% according to the UN. Uh, the UN also reports that about 1.3 billion tons worth of food is wasted annually. Um, that corresponds to 40% roughly of the all produce that's harvested just being thrown directly into the <coughs> landfill. So clearly there's some disparity in the fact that we're overproducing so much and yet so much of our, uh, our population goes hungry every year. So the solution isn't to make more, but it's to work smarter with what we have and preserving that. Um, and again, that ties into the fact that our group thinks a, a novel fruit coating can be a, posi a positive social and economic uh, impact in communities worldwide. So we talked a little bit about why we want to do this, but how can we make this come to fruition? What are our requirements? Firstly, the customer. It's not directly the consumer, but at the beginning it starts with distribution networks. People, or companies like Dole, Del Monte, um, those who are getting the food from farms to the grocery stores. We want to integrate an inexpensive solution um, into their existing production pathways uh, that, so that it doesn't uh, disrupt the flow uh, of their already um, busy process. Secondly, we want to use only food grade and environmentally friendly materials so that there's a zero toxicity for the end consumer. Um, and finally, we want uh, to have a non-intrusive and reliable coating. This means that there's no difference in taste, no difference in texture, no difference in, dis or in color of the produce when it reaches the final consumer. So in, in terms of the functionality uh, of our design, we, we set aside some requirements for that as well. Uh, and this is, we wanted a total cost of around one cent to coat uh, each sample. We wanted no visible discoloration, again mentioning the non-intrusivity of our solution. We want a low thickness, about less than 250 microns. Uh, we wanted to decrease the water loss in produce by 20%, which corresponds roughly to a permittivity value of about 10 to the negative 11 grams per meter pascal second. Um, and finally, we wanted to decrease microbe growth on the surface of these fruits uh, by 10%. And Ben's going to talk a little bit about the mechanism for ripening and why microbe growth and these are so important to it. Okay. So, yep. All produce that we interact with on a daily basis has a unique ripening pathway. Uh, they have their own enzymes that's unique to each species of produce. However, we can roughly group all produce into two main groups, climacteric and non-climacteric fruits and vegetables. Climacteric fruits and vegetables are ones that can be picked before they're ripened and then artificially ripened once they've reached their destination. So think of things like bananas, which are picked green, they're shipped from uh, up here to Canada, and then they're ripened at our distribution centers, versus non-climacteric fruits, which are things that need to be picked while they're ripe. These are things like uh, berries, cucumbers, zucchinis. And these are the things we're gonna focus on because there's no current way to increase their distribution radius. And so we can't reach further markets. And how we're going to increase the shelf life of these fruits and vegetables is we're going to reduce 
the uh, environmental biotic impact factors or stress factors on the fruit. So uh, fruits and vegetables, when they're ripe, they have enzymes within them that are going to uh, disintegrate the pectin, uh, disintegrate the starches, which is going to change the texture and taste of your fruit. And this process speeds up when there are environmental stress factors. And this is somewhat of a defense mechanism for the fruits and vegetables because uh, they're going to want to start deteriorating once they're damaged because that's how they would naturally produce more plants. So if we reduce the water loss, if we reduce the microbe growth, and if we reduce the physical damage to the surface of the fruit, we're going to increase the shelf life. Great. Right. So. Uh, Next, we set aside a f uh, our materials. We needed to talk about what we required from our materials in order to make this work. Um, we put it into two different categories. We have our structural components and our active components. First, for the structural matrices, we wanted them to be highly flexible so that there would be no brittleness or cracking on any of the, or on any of the surfaces of the produce we coated. We wanted it to be completely transparent, homogeneously mixed, so no domain formation. And we wanted it to be completely composed of food grade components, as I mentioned previously. Finally, we wanted to make sure that there was uh, no, or that there was internal material compatibility within the solution during synthesis procedures, so we didn't have precipitation or aggregation due to like a pH value. Um, yeah. So next, the act, starting with the active material, and by active, I just mean that it imparts a specific property onto our film. For example, crystalline nanocellulose we use because uh, it allows for tunable uh, water vapor permittivity. Um, and this is because with increasing concentration of CNC in our product, we notice that there's an increase in density due to uh, higher intramolecular forces um, within the polymer matrix once CNC has been added. Um, next, we use chitosan because of its antimicrobial properties. As Ben mentioned, the importance of making sure that we minimize anti anti -mi or microbial uh, growth on the surface of the produce. Um, and next, both of these materials are envi environmentally friendly and naturally sourced and can be food grade as well. Um, for example, chitosan comes from things like shrimp shells or mushrooms. And since we're doing this on produce, we're going to be using uh, chitosan from like fungal growth and mushrooms. Next, we'll talk a little bit about the analysis. So now that we have our main design considerations in mind, uh, how did we analyze our potential solutions and come up with our final composition? We took a top-down approach to this. We started off with a wide variety of literature ideas. And then as the experimental stages went on, we narrowed it down until we came up with our final design. Uh, the first uh, big analysis stage that we went through was determining uh, which coating we were going to use for our structural matrix. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, literature from other groups who are investigating fruit coatings, and they use things such as alginate, gelatin, starch, and gum arabic, and different com combinations of these uh, main ingredients. These are all food grade materials that are edible. And we followed their procedure except for one main consideration. We know that chitosan, one of our active materials, is only soluble at low pHs. So we included 0.5% chitosan and 1% acetic acid in order to uh, emulate what we we're going to be testing later on because we didn't want any uh, incompatibilities between these materials and what we had going on. Uh, from this, uh, we determined our two main matrices that we decided to go on with, and these were our starch and gelatin matrices. These ones were uh, fairly transparent and flexible compared to ones like alginate, uh, which became inhomogeneous and tacky, and the starch composites were either too brittle or too tough that they wouldn't be useful as a food coating. Uh, based on these two uh, structural matrices that we decided on, we uh, started their water permittivity testing, and we did this by altering their composition of CNC from 0 to 1.5%. That was our upper limit due to uh, viscosity and cost constraints, uh, because it's our, one of our more expensive materials. And as you increase uh, the concentration, your viscosity goes up to a point where it's no longer a usable food coating. And based on this, uh, we set up our tests of glass containers filled with 100 milliliters of water, and we put a paraffin wax seal and a cast film of our individual compositions and let them uh, dissipate their water over a week compared to a control which had no cast film on top of it. And we measured their water loss daily, and these are our results. 
you can see very clearly the two controls are much lower than any of the coded uh, films. And uh, based on our water permittivity testing, we're able to see that our gelatin had a higher permittivity than our starch films, and our starch film with 1.5% CNC had the lowest water permittivity testing, which is what we chose. And we also calculated based on uh, the water loss and the thicknesses of the films, uh, a water permittivity that was within the range of our target goal. And the thickness of this film was around 160 microns, which also meets that criteria. Using uh, this composition of 1.5 CNC and starch, uh, we started with our chitosan testing and we varied this from zero to 1%. We also noticed this increased our viscosity and increased our price, so we limited it at 1%. And we did this to prevent microbial growth on the surface of strawberries. We chose strawberries because one of their main ripening mechanism is through a fungal growth on its surface. And because it's a non-climacteric fruit and it was inexpensive and we could get an abundance of them to test hundreds of samples, which is what we did. Uh, so to test our chitosan concentrations, uh, we uh, set our individual concentrations and we dip coated 20 strawberries in each concentration that we tested and uh, we allowed them to dry for 24 hours, after which we characterized their water loss and their microbial growth. And our microbial growth was based on the highest microbial growth within each of the subgroups. And from that, we were able to determine that our control ripened much faster and rotted much faster than those with higher CNC concentrations. You see in the 1%, uh, or, sorry, chitosan concentrations. In the 1%, we're able to see basically no microbial growth until around the fourth or fifth day, and it decreases as we decrease the chitosan concentration. However, we also noticed as we increased our chitosan concentration, the viscosity reached a critical point where it became unappealing for the fruits, and so we needed to find a proper balance between uh, the concentration of chitosan and its antimicrobial properties, which we'll show you in our quick time lapse. So some things to note about our time lapse, the control, you should expect it to see a great amount of water loss uh, since it has no coating, so the water vapor permittivity is much higher. Uh, and in both the control and the 0% chitosan, you should see early, earlier onset of microbial growth compared to the ones with chitosan within. Okay. So you can see around now the control is starting to grow microbes. And then it becomes very clear. And then around now, our 0% chitosan is growing microbes, while none of the other ones are seeing this growth. And you also see uh, the discoloration that we're getting at the higher percent chitosan concentrations. So we determined the best uh, compromise was to use our 0.25% chitosan in our final product. Here, we'll play one more time, just, fast. just okay. to give you another quick time to look at it, because it's quite quickly, or it goes by quite quickly. So you can just see the water loss of the control there. It almost is the size of the toothpick at this point. <laughs> so based on that, we go into the impact of our design. So based on the concentrations that we talked about earlier, we found that we increased the shelf life of strawberries in room temperature environments from two days to five days. And this results, uh, if we're talking about distribution, we've increased the ground transport from the red circle that we see, which if we're producing strawberries in Ontario, only covers Ontario and the Northeast United States, to covering basically all of North America. And we do this by only increasing the cost of the strawberries by a fractional amount. To coat one strawberry would cost about three quarters of a cent. To coat a pound of them would cost about 11 cents. And uh, this is an easily extendable coating for other climacteric produce, uh, such as uh, cucumbers, zucchinis, and other berries. Yeah. And just to reiterate everything, yeah, thank you. Just to reiterate everything that Ben said, and to show you that we actually met our design goals, um, you've seen that we've developed a highly flexible, a transparent, homogeneous coating. Um, that utilized only inexpensive food grade quality materials and it ended up extending the life uh, or the shelf life of strawberries from two to five days in ambient conditions. 
So we'd like to thank you so much for listening to our presentation. And we'd like to give special acknowledgement to Dr. Michael Tam, who is our support um, throughout the lifetime of this project, as well as other consideration to Jen Coggan and Dr. Chris Backhouse, and to the other two members, uh, Luke Kershaw and Timothy Wong, who couldn't be here right now. All right. Thank you so much.